This is the game of life. And this is a glider. It's a moving pattern that arises in the game because of four simple rules playing out on a grid. There are other interesting and complex patterns that show up too, some with funny names like spaceships, blinkers, and oscillators. These discrete automata are fascinating, but we can take them even further. In this video, we'll build a simple Lenia life simulation in the Godot game engine, using the Open Lenia Jupyter Notebook tutorial on Google Colab as a step-by-step -step guide. The original notebook is still available, and the Godot version will be available in our GitHub repositories if you want to check out the code. Links are in the description. We'll start with the basic game of life and the four rules. We'll get that set up in Godot first, then we'll follow and try to understand each of the steps in the Lenia tutorial to turn the game of life into a fluid, more continuous Lenia simulation. By the end, we'll have the famous Orbium life form running in Godot, and we'll have built some useful display panels for visualizing various fields and the kernel. It won't be fast because we'll do this in GDScript, but in a future video we're going to explore ways to optimize the performance, including things like FFTs, multi-threading, and GPU shaders. The repeating patterns, both in the game of life and within Lenia, could be broadly classified as digital lifeforms, but it's hard to actually distinguish what really constitutes the organism versus mere values within a larger grid field. As we go through the tutorial, keep in mind I'm not trained on any of this and I'm definitely not a mathematician. I just find it fascinating and this type of thing is a great hobby project for a developer. I'll do my best to be accurate, but let me know in the comments if I'm misunderstanding anything in the tutorial. Buckle up! The Game of Life, created by the mathematician John Conway, is a classic cell-based automaton where four simple rules lead to some complex repeating visual patterns. It consists of a grid of cells where each cell can be either alive or dead. The state of the grid evolves in discrete steps, like the ticking of a clock, with the fate of each cell determined by how many of its direct neighbors are alive. Commonly called the birth rule, the two death rules, and the survival rule, these rules determine what the grid will look like on the next clock tick. This simplicity gives rise to recurring patterns and structures that appear to move in lifelike ways. They can grow, replicate, move, and even die, all based on the rules. This is the emergence of complexity from simplicity that drove me to make this video series. Lenia, on the other hand, takes these concepts even further. While it shares the core ideas of discrete cellular automata, Lenia introduces continuous space, along with continuous states and continuous time, resulting in more fluid and organic behaviors. Instead of just being alive or dead, the cells in a Lenia grid have varying degrees of life, and their interactions are governed by growth functions and smoothing functions like bell curves, instead of just counting the number of neighbors that are alive. These changes allow for the emergence of even more complex and visually stunning patterns to be discovered, such as the famous Orbium. Lenia transforms the discrete binary world of Conway's Game of Life into a continuous and dynamic environment, enabling an intricate exploration of the digital life in automata, and there are even some interesting parallels to the way heat and energy propagate in the real world. Here's how we'll take the Game of Life and turn it into a Lenia simulation using Godot. We'll begin with the classic Game of Life where the four rules are applied to the grid of cells once per clock tick. When we run the game with a randomized starting grid, it'll take a few seconds, but we should start to see some of the famous patterns like gliders and simple oscillators. The code in Godot is very small, and starts with two arrays, one to hold the current grid, and a place where we'll store the pending results of the upcoming grid. In the ready function, we'll initialize the arrays. Each cell will be randomly set to alive or dead. We don't always need to randomize the grid during startup, and we could instead load any configuration we wanted, but for simplicity, a random field is an easy place to start. In the draw function, we'll draw the current grid to the screen. If a cell is alive, it'll be drawn as a white square. Otherwise, it'll be drawn as a black square. In the process function that runs for each tick of the game, we'll run the rules on the current grid. We'll store the next upcoming grid values in a different place, so we don't interfere with the current grid. Then, after we've processed every cell, we'll make a quick variable swap, setting the next grid to the current grid. While we're checking each cell in the grid, we count the number of living neighbors around the cell, and then apply the birth, death, and survival rules, 
This lets us decide on if the cell will be alive or dead in the next grid. And that's the basic game of life. It's the starting point for the rest of the tutorial, and hopefully it's easy to follow. Things only ramp up from here as we start to apply the tutorial steps to turn it into a Lenya simulation. To begin extending the game, we'll first change it to use a kernel to perform convolution. The results will look exactly like they did before, but now we're using a dedicated kernel to determine the number of neighbors. In fact, most of the code stays the same. The main changes are our new kernel variable, and where we use that kernel to count the grid neighbors for each clock tick. Next, we'll change how we handle turning the cells on and off. We'll no longer use the neighbor count directly. This change from a hard-coded assignment to an incremental update will allow us to be more granular and have more controlled updates to the cell values later on. Like before, there isn't much to change in the GD script code. When we're processing the cells here, we'll use a growth function to determine the new cell values. And we'll clip these values to make sure they never get set above 1 or below 0. The result still looks like the game of life from earlier. Nothing visually changes. But now we're ready for the next major step in the tutorial where we'll allow cells to have more than just two states. Maybe a cell can be mostly dead, or 80% alive. At this point, there's a side quest in the notebook for those who might be interested, for a similar autonomous system called Larger Than Life. But for this video, we're going to skip that side quest and focus on Lenia. So far, we've dealt with cells that will be either on or off, 1 or 0, alive or dead. The next step introduces an important precursor to Lenia, a system called Primordia. It adds the idea that each cell can have more than just those two possible states. There will be a static and finite number of states that a cell can be in, and we'll follow the tutorial and use 12 states. By allowing cells to exist in more than just two states, we get a very different look to our grid field. The results are more complex, and show some neat designs with shapes that can appear to fade in and out. This new system, called Primordia, sets the stage for Lenia. In our code, we'll set up the 12 distinct states, and we'll modify the few sections of code that deal with those states. When we first set up the random grid, each cell is randomly given one of those 12 possible states. When we get to the growth function, we do two things. We'll scale the growth values by the number of states, and we'll always clamp the resulting value to one of the 12 available states. Great! Now we have the ability for cells to be in one of many states, but if we ever wanted to change the number of possible states, we would have to make all of those changes over again with new scaling. It becomes a whole thing. We'll solve this problem by making the states continuous. Instead of always being forced to have a static number of states, let's make it so we can have an almost infinite number of states. Before we do that, we need to normalize some parts of the code, like the kernel and the growth functions. In the code, Here's how we're normalizing the kernel. And here, we're normalizing the growth function values to be between 0 and 1. This step doesn't impact the visuals yet, but it does set us up for the next part, where we're going to add infinite states and introduce a way to split the time clock into very small intervals. Now we can finally smooth out the states so that they can be any decimal between 0 and 1 effectively giving us an infinite number of states to work with. The specific number of states is no longer important, and we say that the state has become continuous. We'll also make time continuous by introducing a time scaling factor. Once these changes are in place, we'll be able to observe the grid at very small time scales, allowing us to get cell values with lots of decimal points for precision. In GDScript, we'll update the parts of code that used the old states variable removing unnecessary references and converting all values to decimals, and clamping them between 0 and 1. The tutorial breaks time into tiny chunks using two variables, and we'll follow the same approach in our code. The continuous time is achieved by applying grid updates in smaller, more frequent increments, making the simulation feel smoother and more fluid. 
This is where the main time configuration comes in, the constant t, which you can set higher to slow the simulation down or lower to speed it up. We actually use the reciprocal of that constant, dt, when processing the grid values during the growth functions. So depending on how high we set t to, this dt value can be very small, allowing each clock tick to represent smaller and smaller chunks of time. And we say that time becomes continuous as those chunk sizes become smaller and smaller. Okay, after all of that, the results might not look very different from before, but we now have a primordia simulation set up with both continuous time and continuous states. All that's left to finish the main Lenya recipe is to give space the same treatment and make it continuous as well. Now that we've made both states and time continuous in primordia, we can do the same for space. We'll tackle this in three sub-steps. First by making the rectangular kernel larger, then by turning it into a circular kernel, and finally by smoothing it out over space using a bell-shaped function. First, we'll make the kernel larger. We'll define a kernel radius r. With this, we can define how big the kernel is, though it'll still be a rectangle. As r increases, the space in the kernel smooths out, and we say that space becomes continuous. And now we're starting to see some more interesting patterns and effects in the results. However, as the kernel and grid space gets larger, we also notice a drop in execution performance, especially for very large grids and kernel sizes. That's a problem to fix for another day. Until now, we've been working with a rectangular kernel. This can sometimes introduce artifacts and stripes in the grid due to the pointy shape, so let's make it a circle instead. Replacing the rectangular kernel with a circular one removes directional biases, making patterns more isotropic and more natural. We'll use a hard-coded ring-like kernel with a configurable radius r. The circular shape of the kernel removes the bias for horizontal and vertical stripes in the visuals. Finally, we can smooth out the enlarged ring kernel. Utilizing a bell-shaped function like a Gaussian, will generate a smooth kernel that helps us be even more accurate when working with weighted neighbor sums in the growth function. Instead of a hand-drawn kernel, we'll create it on the fly using a bell-shaped function. By convolving with this kernel and using it as the weights, we can get very granular with the growth and decay in the simulation. The pattern should be smoother, but it's usually not very noticeable on smaller randomized grids. But now we have a fully realized linear core with continuous space, time, and states. Impressive. We can now try all sorts of starting configurations and growth settings to see the effects, which brings us to... Instead of a random world grid, let's load up the Orbium by using a very specific starting grid pattern and using some preset growth values. This is one of the famous patterns that Lenya is known for. The Orbium pattern, and many more like it, are lifelike, stable, and self-sustaining structures that are more complex than anything seen in the game of life. There are different variations on the Orbium, subspecies if you will, that we could also load up if we had the right starting conditions. We might look at using some of those in a future video. So that covers the main steps in the tutorial, but we have a few more things to cover in this video that aren't directly called out in the notebook. For better visualization of the different fields and components that go into the Lenya grid, we'll place the creature into a larger world, and we'll display the visuals in four modes. The actual world grid, the weighted neighbor sums, the resulting growth values, and the kernel. The world grid is the main grid we've been looking at so far. The two new display fields are stored in the same way using two-dimensional arrays, and are set during convolution, just like the main world grid is. Then in our drawing function, we simply draw each of those three field displays and add on the final display for the kernel. In an upcoming video, we'll add to these field visualizers, including the cross-section display for the kernel signal that you see in the Jupyter Notebook. And we'll also add some different color themes to the mix. We'll be adding a better UI with some configuration options so you can try out different settings and kernels on your own and maybe discover a pattern no one has seen before.
in addition to the eye candy, we're also going to improve and optimize the Godot project so that it executes faster. We'll look at different techniques, including FFT, multi-threading, and maybe some GPU-enabled enhancements. I hope you found this interesting. The code for the video will be available on GitHub soon. Go ahead and check it out. As always, thanks for watching, and please leave us your comments.